Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking about financial wellness in 2023 with special guests. Mike Croxon, the CEO of the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, Michelle Jones, Chief External Affairs Officer of Money Management International, and Kristen Holt, CEO of Greenpath Financial Wellness. Thank you all for joining. It's so great to to uh, have you on and and to talk about this really important topic. Thank you for having. Thank us. you for having us, Mark. Oh, we're going to have a great time. So um, I'm going to uh, set you up and. And I'm going to go over to you, Mike, first. Uh, most of our modern lives uh, are spent uh, working, earning, spending, buying stuff, right? I mean, it's really so much part of our day. And then in the evening when we go home, we we have to go to the store. We have to buy uh, things. We have to pay rent. We have to deal with our cash flow. We have to deal with our credit scores, interest rates, which are going up. Um, we're actually coming slightly down uh, now. Credit card companies, that every single day is imbued with these transactional interactions where we have to deal with money. So um, let's start with the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. How does NFCC uh, function to support its members and to ultimately help people like me? Great. Well, listen, thank you again for uh, having me here. And thank you also for two excellent co-panelists to join the time with me. These these folks represent incredible organizations. You're going to hear some really great uh, stories and examples about how they help individual consumers. Uh, the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, the NFCC, uh, is a, a trade association of credit counseling agencies. We represent um about 50 or 55 agencies around the country. And we've been doing this for about 72, 73 years. Um, and, and in it, all of our member agencies have counselors who are certified so that anyone who's speaking with them knows that they're talking to someone who is qualified and capable. And, and I do say speaking to because historically, right, it was a face-to-face -face across the desk kind of conversation. And that has morphed over time to where we are today. Um, uh, and, you know, I think that if there's anything I would, you know, your conversation or your, 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 your prompt there was exactly right. You know, people go off and spend money every day and it's sort of like, how do they manage? And, and, and today is no different than 72 years ago. Our member agencies are extraordinarily good at intervention. So when someone has a crisis and a problem and they show up and they need help, we know how to put the pieces back together with them to make a plan. Because what happens with most people is that they juggle a lot of balls, as you described it in the intro, right? They, they have a lot going on and they don't really know exactly how they get the balls up in the air over time, but they do and they manage and they rob Peter to pay Paul and they deal with inflation and they do whatever they have to do until something happens, right? car engine blows up, a kid goes to the emergency room, something happens and all the balls you break, you break your arm. And, and, and people don't know what to do. They don't know how to get restarted. And that's where we step in and help them build a plan. And that really, I think, is the key for everybody, right? Is what, what is the inducement to make you want to have a plan? Because financial wellness is a pathway that's basically a plan. This is, I want to get that, I want to get to this place and if I can control what I'm doing along the way, then I have far greater chance of success so that when that engine blows up or a kid goes to the emergency room, yes, I can take that financial body blow, but I don't have to not be successful with my larger life. So I, I, I hopefully that, that, that addresses the question, tells you a little bit about what the NFCC does, but it really tells you what Greenpath and, and um, MMI do every day to help consumers. And that's why we put together this panel, right? You support the ecosystem, and then you have the direct services uh, folks, uh, which which are represented by Money Management International and uh, Green Path Financial Wellness. One of the things that really strikes me is that in in the early days of this country, we were dealing. It was a cash economy, and it was a barter economy, and then it became a cash economy, a barter economy, and you would perhaps have a merchant, and you might owe, you might have have uh, some owed uh, amount uh, that you were paying off. And then it became that plus 
banks. And then it became that plus credit card companies. And now every cell phone that we have can can be used as a as a payment device, right? Um, and and then we've got all these different, you know, E-Trades and Schwab and all these different companies. It's really complicated, isn't it, Michelle? When somebody comes in and they're all tangled up, they've lost track. They've got some um, uh, credit cards that are at at low interest rates or no interest rates that they've taken out, and then they they balloon up to seventeen percent and so on. How do you how do you deal with somebody sort of walking in, not even be able being able to tell you what's going on? They just know they are in serious, serious, serious trouble. Sure, you know one of the things that. Um, we've seen Mark is there is so much information available out there. Like you said, you know, there are all these resources and support systems and education platforms and that type of thing. And I think what we typically see is people come in and they know this is available, but there is so much that's available. But the question is, how do I apply that to my life? And we even see that in the education seminars that we offer. So we'll do a seminar on budgeting and inevitably a line queues up either virtually or in person and wants to talk to our presenter about how to apply the information they just learned to their specific circumstance. And I think our counselor's ability to separate the noise from the truly actionable next steps that they need to take to move them ahead is one of the most beneficial things that counselors Could bring to the table. Please do that in my entire life because- I'm, I'm happy to, yeah. That noise is, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm actually not kidding, right? I mean, well, and you know- I feel like we, we are inundated with stuff all the time now. We almost don't get a rest. Yeah, it's it's so complicated and everyone's out there trying to get you to part with your money all the time, right? Like, oh, don't want to miss out on this sale or this. Oh, I, I do need new shoes. And, you know, it's just crazy. You're bombarded left and right. And I, you know, I totally agree with Michelle. I think the important thing that we do as financial counselors is understand each person's unique situation and look at their situation holistically and help them figure out what's important to them and what is the next step that they can take. Because typically people are coming to us from a pretty overwhelmed place. And that's one of the things, like I loved how Mike was describing it. Um, it would be great to have a plan up front. Most times people don't. And that's when they are finding their way to us. And oftentimes it's after they've been maybe taken advantage by something else that's out there. And that's what we really want to figure out how to get upstream and help people take that next step. So staying with, with uh, you, Kristen, and Michelle for a second, is part of what's going on here when somebody comes in, and I hate to sound a, a little bit sort of new wave, but are you trying to basically first calm, calm everything down and just sort of say, okay, let's all take a breath. It's almost like a little bit of psychological counseling. And then basically you go from having having a fast break life where there's so much going on to just saying, okay, wait a second, let's just stop. Let's start to organize. I mean, it's basically kindergarten skills, right? Put everything in the cubby or, you know, organize your your pencils and your paper and whatever whatever else you have. It's 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 almost like that kind of a let's get back down to essentials and let's just even look at the problem. Is that what's what's going on here, Kristen? Yeah. So we have an empathy coach on staff and we train all of our counselors, all of our frontline people in empathy and nonviolent communication because people are coming to us from a place of scarcity. And you know, when your brain is in scarcity, you can't function. Yeah. And so the first thing we have to do is calm down the brain so that they can, you know, engage in the discussion. You find, Michelle, that it's an emo that it's that kind of an emotional. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, we actually did a lot of research with our clients that we serve, as well as people just out in the world who are expressing concern about debt. And what we saw over and over and over was how stigma and shame held people back from getting the help that they needed. We actually, there's some research out there that shows 92% of people who have a debt issue will talk to no one about it. 
only 8% of people are reaching out to professional for advice. And so one of the things we really work on is trying to decrease that sense of um, stigma, to decrease that sense of shame, to help normalize. This is a challenge that easily 75% of the people in our country have. So if somebody's sitting there struggling alone is afraid to reach out, you can look to your left, left and your right, and chances are you have people right there with you who are going through some of the same challenges. And so helping people know that it's okay to reach out for help it's not the worst we've ever seen. Um, it, and helping them to calm down that moment and look at things is really important. And I'll add, one of the things we know is once somebody takes that step and engages with a financial counselor, what we do really is to help them, in, like you said, to organize. But part of they have been so afraid to really look at the full picture because they were afraid it will be insurmountable. So you stop opening the bills. You stop clicking on those emails, right? You, you don't have a full accounting because you're scared. And that's one of the things we do is we take that big, scary thing. We make it manageable. And we talk about, so what do you do next? Because for me, it's all about next steps. It's not about how we're going to climb this huge mountain. It's what's the best next step that we can take today. So, Mike, if you take a look at the at, at the challenge that we have in this country, um, what does your research tell you about how these uh, financial issues distribute throughout the nation, and and where uh, 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 there are clusters of people who have these kinds of of, of issues? Um, is it is it uh, defined by geography? rural versus urban? Is it defined by race? Is it defined by gender? Or is it just basically everybody has the, has the same amount of problems regardless? You, you know, it, 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 it'd be great if I could tell you that there was a way to hone in on some particular population that needs help and the rest don't. don't. What I can tell you is from having done this for 25 years or more, is that the breakdown of consumers who will raise their hand and need help breaks down exactly the same as the population of our country. Oh, so really? It's, it's almost identical. You know, it's like 11% of the population of people who need help come from Florida. Guess what the population of Florida is? 11% of the country. I mean, it really is a very geographically dispersed. Wherever you find people, you're going to find the issue. And uh, ultimately, the customers of the agencies really do line up very similar to however the population is. Now, in, in terms of the, the typical consumer who works with a credit counseling agency over time, right? Someone who goes on a structured repayment program to kind of get their feet back under them, the, where they get benefits from the creditors um, uh, in order to maintain a budget. That breaks down a little bit differently. I would tell you, you know, the last time I looked was about a year ago, but the average consumer is a woman. She's around 37 years old. She has about thirty-eight dollars or $40,000 of household income and about $20,000 of unsecured debt. So 50% debt to income ratio before she even pays her mortgage or car payment or anything else. So the average is 37-year-old woman Your take. as a 50% uh, debt to income ratio um, is in the... Um, is is this is this a, a, a person in general in a uh, three person four person one person household? Oftentimes, single mom. Um, single mom? But they, they are usually they are usually a parent, and they're usually uh, usually frequently single. And and so when when you look at at that income, that income is a topped out income for a single person, uh, usually living in that kind of circumstance, taking care of children as well. So there's no place for her to go on the top line stuff. The rest, the rest of it is just managing her financial means and not getting into trouble. That, that's well, it's, that's it's, the average. It is, it is, it is back to what we talked about earlier. It's about having a plan and knowing that you, you need to live to a plan, but also know that there's places you want to get in your life, right? It's not just about surviving. I mean, the intervention part is the survival bit. But important in that conversation that the counselors have with consumers is, what do you hope for? What do you want to accomplish, right? And, and when you really start breaking it down, it, it tends to kind of fall in what I would call four categories. It's sort of how you spend, how you save, how you borrow, and how you plan, you know, and your, your, your spending goes into those buckets and you help a person with a plan around that. So if you have an aspiration that you want to send one of your kids to college, well, you need a plan for that, right? And you, it becomes part of what's important to you and what you do every day. 
And maybe coffee from Starbucks isn't as important as sending your kid to college in 20 years. And so you make that decision, but it's a planned decision. You know, we just took a poll. It's really interesting. What is your top financial concern? And we got um, a lot of people uh, paying rent, medical bills. Um, interestingly enough, nobody said credit card bills, uh, but meeting da daily uh, living expenses. I think that we've, we've um, reiterated so often, be careful about credit card, be careful about credit cards, that, that maybe that message is, is getting across. But here's the one that really topped all of them, having to save for the unexpected event having to save for the unexpected event. How often when people uh, are tipped into crisis, if you were going to say um, how often there, there, there's, there's that comes about, how often is it a unexpected event that precipitates somebody walking into your uh, places, Michelle and Kristen? It's for us, it's the vast majority of the cases. Typically, like you said, somebody has been I mean, people are working hard. They're working to pay their bills. They're working to cover their life's expenses, right? And then something happens. You're transferred for work. And suddenly you're flying back across the country more often than you thought you would be to visit your family, right? Or somebody has an unexpected medical expense. Or you miss two days of work because there was a snowstorm in Dallas. Who would have thought, right? And you suddenly lost uh, on two days of work. Those types of things that when you're already living close to the edge can just bump you off and make it very difficult to get back on course. So what we're talking about is a is a working poor issue, right? It's a huge number of people who are working poor, meaning that they're that that they're working, they're able to um, to uh, uh, support themselves, their families, but they're working so close to the edge that as soon as something happens and inevitably on an average, you're going to get a certain uh, uh, number of those events, you end up going into crisis. Kristen, is this the kind of thing that just has to be managed or is it the kind of thing that can be prevented, right? Is, do you, do you, you understand what I, what I mean by that? If people are so close to the edge, it's, 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 it's great to say, well, we are going to get you on a sustainable path. But if you're so close to the edge, there is no ability to create sustainability because sustainability requires money. And, and if people are, are absolutely working as hard as they can flat out, um, are we going to always have a need for services like yours? Well, I think there's always a need for trusted financial advice and being able to figure out how to navigate and make those daily financial decisions. So it doesn't just have to be when that crisis occurs, that is often when people contact us. Um, and what we find is that people will try to manage on their own for as long as possible, too. So when you talk about the edge, you know, people are at different places on the edge. But if their parent gets sick and they have to quit their job to take care of their mother and then their mother passes away and then they're going through this period of mourning and, you know, they finally get back to trying to manage their own life and they realize, oh, my God, it's completely out of control. So, I mean, it's not just people living on the edge. It's really everyone. And if you, you, you need to have a plan and you need to prepare for those things in the future. And yes, it's easier to do that. If you have higher income, you might be able to last longer. Um, but everyone really needs a plan. And every financial decision is like a new decision, right? And so having someone to check in with on that can really help just to make sure, okay, am I making the best decision in this moment for my life? So Michelle, yeah, just one question, Mark, one point I would, I would add to that is, and, and I think it's really important in the context of, of sort of the way you describe the situation, right? I think, I think one of the important things we see from consumers that is a really important and valuable part of American life is that um, credit is ubiquitous in our markets today, right? I mean, everybody uses it. It's around us all the time. But it's also interesting that m the vast, vast majority of people who contact the agencies for help feel a moral obligation to repay their creditors. I borrowed this money. I need to find a way to pay back what I owe. And I think that's a really important dimension um, uh, in, in this whole 
um, discussion is that these folks are folks that, like everybody else, want a good life for themselves and their families, but they also want to live up to their obligations. And that's an important dimension and why the creditors are supportive of this industry. Well, it's, a, it's such a very important point, right? It's, it's, this, it's this idea that we are socialized into honoring what we say. And that's a good thing, right? That is part of, of the uh, glue. It's the fabric of, of uh, how Americans try to function in this world, how we try to move through this world. And, and Michelle, when, when people uh, come into you, if they, instead of coming in during crisis, if they came in to do planning, do you take up uh, Kristen's point that everybody needs a plan? And as a matter of fact, what we really ought to do, Mike, is increase your membership considerably by basically all of us before we hit crisis coming in and speaking with Michelle and Kristen and and taking advantage of your services. Michelle, do you, do you feel like um, a lot of those crisis moments could be avoided? If if we did some pre planning, um, or is it? I or do, planning? but I, I yeah, no, I I do because the the benefit of a plan is that you aren't having to remake decisions over and over. If you understand your end goal and your decisions are always in alignment with that end goal, it makes it much easier to make those minute by minute decisions when you're going through your day because you're not saying no to something that you really want in the moment. You're saying no to that impulse because you're saying yes to your bigger goal. But what I would add to that is it's it's not realistic. That That's not how we as humans operate, right? We absorb this information the best when there's a real need. So you can talk about how to manage your credit cards, why it's not smart to just make your minimum payment, put money in savings. That just kind of washes past you until you're in the moment and you look at your credit card bill and it just suddenly went up from 9,000 to 9,500 and you're like, but I made my minimum payment. Why is this not going down? Right. That I think those are the real teachable moments. And I think it's only human nature. And I just want to go back to the point that was made earlier about who uses our services. And Mike's right, like the average household income, 40, 50,000, but you've got to recognize what I want people to recognize is when you look at those averages, that is an easy way for people to dissociate the need from themselves. Because we're talking to people who have household incomes of 100,000, 150,000, 20,000, right? And, and financial, the financial space is the one area where um, you don't really respond to what you are told your peers are. We don't believe it. You know, you get those little notes in the mail, 80% of your neighbors voted, have you? That sways us in those type of settings. Your financial life is the one place that you're not swayed because you believe you're so unique and different. And so that's I, I really work on helping people understand that anybody who has a credit card and income and a more, you know, pays for a place to live, like you have these basic components in your life, you could benefit from, from a financial coach helping you understand how to navigate. And these financial challenges happen at every end of the income scale. Scale. It's just what your crisis is like looks different from you. I was watching an Oprah show and she said, you know, I don't have those problems, but I've got different problems. I still have problems. <laughs> that, that is true on the financial spectrum. You know, um, we're going to come we're going to come back to a little bit about how the ecosystem works and how you're funded. But but I've got a, a question that came up with really interesting, um, which was how to address systemic issues. Right. So the whole the whole idea is if you're talking about an average uh, income of uh, of forty five, fifty thousand dollars, thirty seven year old woman and so on and so forth. Well, if you take a look at certain communities um, where income averages out to be less than that, if you look at African-American communities or you look at at certain other communities and then when you look at regionally defined communities, and then you slice again by, by race and income and so on and so forth. What you find is those averages are way, way down. Is it possible that uh, people who are really in need but are at the le at less, at that 20,000 uh, level that you were talking about, Michelle, that when you get down to, to that level of income, that there are other barriers for people to access your services? I mean, 
we, uh, Mike, you were talking about the fact that we all use these uh, these devices nowadays, Zoom and and uh, and our cell phones, but we need bandwidth for that, right? We need to have a cell phone. We need to have a computer. Um, and then there's there's the whole issue of just sort of the embarrassment. And are, are you going to find somebody who's had a lived experience like yours that you're actually going to talk with if you go walk into Green Path? How do you all look at this at this aspect of it? Are we serving all of America, or are we only serving the America that we come in contact with? Yeah. So for yeah, Green Path. This is a huge focus of ours and really for the industry as a whole. So 46% of the people that we serve are BIPOC, and we recognize that oftentimes our services may fall short. You start first with there's a more of a distrust in BIPOC communities with financial services, and they are often targeted with these bad players out there and things that are trying to take advantage of people. So they have to comb through and figure out who are the good guys, who can I trust, um, and that's where nonprofit credit counseling really comes in and people have to find us. And so, you know, we tend to work through um, trusted other nonprofits uh, to try to get referrals. So people know that, OK, this these are the good people that I can trust them and I can have that conversation. And, you know, we we have a diverse staff. So we really uh, try to have where people can be t- speaking with someone who understands their situation, um, who maybe you've familiar with it and can really try to tailor the advice to what they're dealing with. I think that's uh, a, a great a barrier. point. This, this idea of, of having an ecosystem, just like you work with Mike um, and you work, uh, you also work with other partners who might be better positioned to help a particular person mm-hmm. than you are. Michelle, are you finding the same thing? And I, I'll ask things like, if you look at supportive housing organizations, right? Sometimes they need credit counseling advice within that environment if you if you look at uh people exiting incarceration or or uh people who have uh disabilities or have interacted with yeah. because they have cancer or whatever they've got they need those those cool. advisory services are you working with partners who might be dealing with different populations with different needs whether it's cancer or or um some other issue yeah. Yep, we have partnerships that um, support medical debt because we understand the challenge that is. We have we are a fully bilingual English and Spanish organization because we recognize the need to help serve Spanish speakers in our country as well as people who've been here for a couple of generations but still identify with their immigrant community. Um, but I would also say in terms of reach, when we looked at the pen during the pandemic, we've done a ton of rental counseling and African-American men who are renters who reached out to us for help, 85% came to us on their phone. So we have been making a lot of investments in online counseling, in mobile-friendly online counseling. I understand that doesn't address the bandwidth issue, but for people who do have access and want the anonymity because you're not sure what you're going to meet on the other side of the table, that can be a really safe way for people to engage with us and, and get solutions. And I feel like that's been one of the huge breakthroughs for our organization over the past few years. Let's, because we're coming to the end of our time. Let me just add also, if I can, Mark, just, just you know, the, 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 the breadth that, that Kristen and Michelle's organizations have, right, national in scope, uh, the ability to serve consumers, uh, however consumers want to be served, is crucial and important. I also would say that we have member agencies uh, in the NFCC that are traditional community-based multi-service organizations that, in addition to credit counseling, also do the wraparound services that a consumer in a community might want. And so the idea of full breadth and full reach with the NFCC is if that's the kind of service that that a consumer needs, there's access to that as well. So, I, I mean, your point is a good one, and we haven't figured out how to crack the nut on all of this this reach issue, but it is it is embedding itself in every activity that we have about how do you find ways to leverage counselors to be available in the terms that consumers really want them, whether it's in person, on the phone, via electronic device, et cetera. Let's wrap up with, with uh, Mike, um, you, Michelle, and Kristen talking a little bit about how you support your operations, because one of the things that that does happen is when we get into trouble, we blame somebody else. I do it, right? And uh, I shouldn't, but I blame the banks or I blame 
the credit card companies, or I blame whoever I can externally blame. And it's it's not that I'm entirely wrong, but I could, should also look in the mirror sometimes, right? So, Mike, when when you talk about the support that you that you have, what kind of support do you get? Where does that support come from? And Michelle, I'd like to I'd like you to talk about that, and we'll we'll wind up uh, with Kristen. How how does this work? Is this uh, coming in only from fees? Do you have uh, industry support? Um, how how does this this whole thing come together so that we're actually solving a problem together? Yeah, it's a great question, and. Um... You know, innovation uh, in our industry, as we talked about already, is crucial. And so finding foundations and creditors and other organizations that will fund grants for us to test and build and examine new opportunities is a, is a crucial part about how we operate. And, and that is fundamentally, you know, I, I can tell you from the NFCC's perspective, the work that we do on behalf of all of our members is funded slight, somewhat by by membership dues of roughly 15%. But the other 85% of funding comes from our efforts to go out and raise money to create initiatives that the entire industry will benefit from. And each of the agencies do their own grant work, and we try to coordinate the activity to make sure that it is collectively uh, leveraging everyone. But uh, it, it is fundamentally through kind of traditional nonprofit model where you go out and find people who have an interest in what you're trying to do and communities you're trying to serve, and they're willing to invest in uh, making things better for people. Now, some people will say that's just greenwashing, but isn't it just also a rational business investment? If you, if your business, if part of the consequence of your business is that it might have negative effects for a certain subset of your customers or potential customers, don't you want to invest in solving that problem? Because if that problem gets out of hand, it's going to affect everyone in a detrimental way. It'll affect the individuals detrimentally. It'll affect the business detrimentally. So this isn't just a matter of people feeling guilty or trying to uh, make a grant so that they're given a pass. This is a industry that also recognizes that they need to invest philanthropically in dealing with part of the offshoot of their uh, of, of what they're doing. Yes, and everyone benefits from improved financial wellness. I mean, if you think about the extended effects, like financial stress can contribute to bad health outcomes and it all just links yes. together. And so there's a ton of benefit for investing in financial wellness. Well, one of the things that I that I really love about this country is that we spontaneously recognize problems and then we often take action together across different views to fix it. Michelle, we'll give you the last word. How do you think that we should sustainably address this issue but also be able to respond on a on a um, point to point uh, personal level with empathy, with um, with help, um, but but help to uplift people from uh, these cycles of, of debt and relief. Yeah, I think being able to partner with organizations that really understand their consumers and the people they're serving to make sure they're giving the best service and advice is a great step one, like you get with NFCC member agencies, right? Uh, but I also think companies making the investment in their consumers that with their consumers who are struggling is always a smart move. Like you said, right? That is smart business. That is part smart um, care for your customers. I think there's a great place for that. And then when I think about philanthropy, that's a great place um, that innovation can be supported. We were serving people under, there's a program called Project Porchlight that helps people recover financially after a natural disaster. When the pandemic hit, we had foundations who immediately pivoted and saw COVID as a disaster that could be served through that program and provide us with the funding so that we could switch and adjust and modify so that we were adequately serving people who had that very distinct um, challenge. And so I think philanthropy is a, a great place to support innovation. I think also this whole idea of, of people recognizing issues and investing in those issues, philanthropically investing in those issues in order to take responsibility 
and to be part of the solution is so laudable. Um, I'd like to thank you all. I want to also share with you the uh, last poll, which is what is the most important uh, money skill that should be taught in school? Budgeting, budgeting, mm. budgeting. Mike Croxon, CEO of the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, Michelle Jones, Chief External Affairs Officer of Money Management International, and Kristen Holt, CEO of Green Path Financial Wellness. Thank you so much for your work. Thank your members. Thank your staffs. Thank your board. Thank the businesses that are investing in you. Thank your volunteers. Thank your donors. And thank your clients because they, too, are part of the solution. Really appreciate your help today and your insights. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.